I think we're going to have a really big impact on amazingly well-rounded, stronger architects and stronger architectural leaders in the years to come. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and today I have the fabulous pleasure of speaking with Robert Yuen, who is the founder, co-founder of Monograph, and Sarah Hughes, who is the Associate Principal and Director of Finance and Operations at Snow Acrylic Architects. This was a brilliant conversation, thoroughly enjoyed speaking and picking the brains of these two shining lights of financial literacy and intelligence in the architecture sphere. It was really, really insightful. So a little bit about each of the the guests today. Robert was trained in architecture, quickly recognized the need for better business tools and has been the one really driving and at the helm of developing Monograph, a project management software to address the challenges that face Um, architecture and engineering professionals. He has become a leading voice in the industry, promoting the importance of A&E business performance and helping firms improve their workflows and profitability. His mission is to always be in service to the design professionals responsible for our built environment, letting them focus on what they love and do best. I really, really enjoy speaking with Robert and I do feel um, you know, this is the mission of business of architecture as well, very well aligned here. So Monograph, highly recommended piece of software. Many of our clients use it and absolutely adore it. It's a beautiful piece of intelligence and is constantly involving. It's a software company uh, who really are revolutionizing the future of architecture and engineering firm performance. Firms use Monograph to make quick and confident decisions about budgeting and resources to drive their practices forward. Um, Sarah appreciates the problem-solving nature of architecture and enjoys the challenges supporting industry operation. She's got a very unique professional arc. So she's an architect turned accountant. So a decade as a designer, followed by another decade of small creative business financial consulting has allowed her to understand multiple sides of architecture practice. Her education and experience have fueled her passion for promoting the value of architecture as a service and fair pricing models. Sarah is responsible for the company's project staffing, coordination, firm operations and growth, profit and loss tracking, and financial goals management. She oversees project scheduling and workload assessment She enjoys implementing internal systems and industry tools to make firm operations more efficient and transparent at all levels of practice. She is involved with many organizations and forums supporting small business needs and architecture firm ingenuity. So this was, as I said, a absolute delight for me. We talked about all sorts of things, but we really focused in on cash flow cadence, the importance of establishing a good rhythm with money coming and going within your business. We all we are very aware of the feast of famine cycles that architecture practices deal with. And Robert and Sarah talk very intelligently and insightfully about how to even out those flows. We talk about the importance of financial transparency, how to communicate what what's going on with the finances and profit inside of your business, how to do it compassionately, how to do it intelligently, how to do it so there's no upset, but also so people understand and have responsibility about seeing and looking at the numbers that are being given to them. And we also talk about the importance of building a budget, both for projects and both for your finances in your business and their overheads. So sit back, relax and enjoy Robert Yuen and Sarah Hughes. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Robert and Sarah, welcome to the business of architecture. How are you both? I'm well, thank you. Same here, doing great. Fantastic. Well, good to have you. Uh, well, good, to, Robert, have to have you back again. You are the CEO and founder of Monograph, oh, which yeah. has quickly become, certainly on, on our side, uh, with our BOA clients, one of their favoured um, project management tools and software. It's a beautiful looking piece of kit and it's certainly something which has been well needed in the architecture industry. Uh, and Sarah, um, you're not an architect, is that correct? Correct. 
Aha, fantastic. And you work on the finance uh, asp side of yes. Snow Kralik Architects? Correct. Well done. You got it right the first time. Um, <laughs> yes, I used to practice 100 years ago, and then I switched gears and switched over to the financial side and wound up doing finance um, implementation and consulting for upwards of two dozen different uh, mm -hmm. A&E businesses within the Twin Minneapolis Twin Cities area. Um, and now I full-time do the finance for Snow Cryolic. Amazing, brilliant. Well, I, I think let, to, to kind of kick off, um, we're, we're kind of in a period at the moment of, let's call it economic uncertainty. Um, if we were to look at some of the um, writings of Ray Dalio recently and his kinds of uh, memoirs on the changing world order. There's a kind of interesting macroeconomic picture that's being portrayed where the US and the West is, you know, the, things are changing and shifting. We've just come out of this um, crazy pandemic, which obviously had a big impact um, economically, but for most architecture practices actually left them you know in abundance really and working working very well but now we're kind of we don't know what the future is basically there's been talk of recession for a long period of time and, and, I'm, and i'm going to assert that both of you have a pretty good grasp of knowing that architects aren't always the best um financial observers if you like in their in their businesses so perhaps, perhaps we can start there of, of um you know, having a, a kind of finger on the pulse inside of the architecture industry, what what are what are practices seeing with a shift in the uh, the economy at the moment? I was actually just when you noted we we're in a state of economic uncertainty. I am trying to think of a time in my twenty plus year experience in architecture when <laughs> architects have <laughs> ever felt there was economic certainty, because it is just. <laughs> I don't know if it's geographical or um, generational or what have you, but even when times are good, times are spoken of as though they are bad and disparate in the architecture practice. Um, so I think we're just, you know, running strong as always. Like, <laughs> it's always a state of flux. Um, but I will let Robert speak to his, any, his observations about the current state there's anything specific let, let me see if i can roll with the punches here um the industry is probably always in a state of uncertainty but the type of uncertainty changes mm -hmm. mm. so the typology of uncertainty changes through cycles and we're just dealing with a new typology um but i think that's really well put like i've been an architect for maybe 10 years before starting monograph and it's always been uncertain. I just, mm -hmm. it's probably the typology of uncertainty mm -hmm. does changes. And there's good typologies, like a ton of work, the phone's ringing, uh, and how do I solve that problem? And there's other times when the phone is not ringing and I have a different mm -hmm. problem. Um, but in either way, they're both classified as uncertainty. Yeah, absolutely, and I, and I think I fall prey to um, the being in the in the media, if you like, sometimes where we're always talking about some kind of drama, if you like, with mm -hmm. the economy, and this is this is often something that's you know that we we do we see it in the media all the time that there is a never-ending narrative of doom and gloom, mm -hmm. or something shifting and changing that we've got to be kind of heightened. Our awareness needs to be heightened around. Um, in terms of running uh, an architecture practice, what do you think are some of the the key things that we should be looking at financially, the kind of numbers that we should be really paying attention to in any period of, of, of economic uncertainty, if you like? Um, I can say on our end, and based on the size of the firm that we are, we are... Uh, about 40 people, and the region that we are located in, which is in the Minneapolis, Minnesota, like middle America, um, what we have shifted to is to really continue to keep an eye on our cash flow um, mm -hmm. 12, ideally 18 months out at all times. And 
The reality is anything after six months, given our size and the flux of the economy, um, is really an educated estimation, but that's still a baseline that you can continue to look at and predict off of as you are marching along over time. Um, I feel like it's the best way to, for our size and circumstance, it's the best way to really predict where you're going to have holes in your workflow, where you're going to have holes in your staffing, where you are going to have an abundance of staff um, that doesn't necessarily match with how much project fee and budget you have available. Um, even little things like really paying attention into your cash flow around the time of the holidays. We as architects tend to apply like a general schedule and budget all the way through the course of a year. And it's like, well, like we just kicked off summer, right? Like we really need to see how many people are taking off time in the summer. We need to see how many people are really taking off those last two weeks of the calendar year. Those have huge impacts when it's not just one or two people, it's 30 people um, who's going to fill in the gaps. Um, how are we going to get the work done that needs to be done? Um, so that's what I've been using as of late, especially since 2020 um, mm -hmm. and the huge disparity in cash flow that happened during that calendar year. Cash flow tend to be the best predictor of how to engage with upcoming changes um, in both effort, workload, and overall economy. I'm, I'm, I'm going to assert that 18 months actually sounds like a really, really long time for it a lot is. of practices. Yes, it is. And that's, again, that's why I'm openly saying after six months, you are just saying we could probably predict six months reasonably. And then what could we have an educational estimate on for the year after that? And so like, what of, are... You yeah, what are baseline costs we know? Like we know our rent is probably going to be X amount all the way across. Mm -hmm. We know um, the cost of our health insurance is going to be X amount all the way across. We know that we have these three projects that have a locked in uh, government contract that pays mm -hmm. on target the X amount of months. Um, those are the things that at least you can have placeholders in there. It's not going to be for certain. It's not something that you would ever use as, some, as a financial uh, worksheet that you would send to a bank or something. Um, mm -hmm. But it gives you some groundwork that you can build on. And once you have that built out 18 months, as you go each month updating it from where you were and then adding another month down the line, you find a lot of patterns. Um, architects are great with pattern recognition. They love that stuff. So mm -hmm. you just give them opportunities to kind of plug and play and see like, here's the consistencies. And so what are we going to assume are the inconsistencies? Yeah. Brilliant. I really love this topic and I love, love to dig in because I have a lot of friends that misinterpret cash flow mm -hmm. as in some totals. Yeah. So I think it's, right. it's really important for us, I think, to touch upon like, what does cash flow mean? Mm -hmm. um, and like the best way I can describe and I love your help here, Sarah, like I think, I think of cash flow as cadence. Mm -hmm. How often do cash leave mm -hmm. and come in? And that's the most important part of cash flow mm -hmm. is the cadence. Mm -hmm. um, so like you make payroll every, every other week or once yeah. a month. You pay rent once a month, every month. Yeah. Those things I think most of us know. I think I would love for every architect to think about, well, how often do you get paid? Yeah. Because like if it's not monthly, why not? Mm -hmm. And if it's not monthly and if it's on a phase base, is it predictable? Because then, mm -hmm. then you have issues around knowing your cadence of cash flow. Mm -hmm. If you don't know your cadence for cash flow, you can't plan. And it makes, mm -hmm. it makes the future scary. Yeah. Um, and we're, all I'm trying to do here is try to make it less scary. And like, you got to know your cadence. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cadence is important relative to cash flow. I think that from my experience of going in and out of so many firms over the course of a decade, I, there's two main observations that I've seen that I could say universally without hesitation about every firm. Every firm assumes the other firms know exactly what they're doing and as opposed to themselves where they just assume they're doing it wrong or they don't have all the information outside firms have. And two, they have all the information they actually need 
to make it a less scary situation. It's just either needing to take the time to do it, finding someone to take the time to lay the information out, um, and most importantly, actually acknowledging how much information they truly have. So mm -hmm. a product like Monograph or any project management system, any financial system, it's all in there. It's just mm -hmm. how do you whittle down what you need to make it worth your while and make it um, easily, easily routinely accessible. So it's not a chore to f look at your information. Well, I, I, I really love this idea of number one, having kind of, you know, accessibility to information so that you can start, you know, being able to establish what your cadence is with cash flow and actually just thinking about cash flow as a rhythm, as a heartbeat, as a cadence, mm -hmm. because when we look at lots of architectural practices and how they bill, you know, it surprises me to this day, how many practices still bill using some kind of milestone method which is really vulnerable. It's, it's vulnerable to <laughs> client changes and indecisions. It's, it's vulnerable to other, you know, good, well-meaning consultants not delivering their work when they said they were going to deliver it or something comes up and there needs to be a change. Or, you know, I know that in the US, you're very similar to here in the UK with your planning authorities. Um, it's somewhat of an antiquated, perhaps a little bit more bureaucratic process and decisions don't always get made as timely as we want them to. Or that, you know, you haven't put your North Arrows on your drawings and they all get sent back and you've got to resubmit them or something like that. Mm -hmm. But that, that all that means is that, you know, particularly with larger projects, with more complexity that billing on a milestone like a delivery milestone or, a, or even worse a project milestone then that's a moving target which then means <laughs> that your cash flow is now going to be moving so yes. how do you what, what kind of advice would you give or how have you seen practices um even out or, or establish more rhythm more predictable cadence with their with their billing um don't bill based on milestones <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. Genius. Um, <laughs> I can say the most successful billing cycle is 30 days. Uh, mm -hmm. Shorter sounds great because it makes it out to be that maybe there's smaller payments and they're more incremental and there's a constant cash flow. Um, but your clientele is less likely to pay on time when those shorter increments. It's just the pattern mm -hmm. that I've seen. Um, and a lot of public uh, companies and especially government companies, they they are dictating their terms to you. You are not dictating your terms to them. So 30 days is usually where everyone can you know come to an agreement. 30 to 45 days. Um, milestones for all the reasons you just listed, not a great idea. Um, and on top of all the reasons you just listed in terms of it being a very vulnerable situation in terms of incoming cash, add to it that you bill on the milestone. That doesn't mean they're paying you right away. So then you add 30 to 45 to, if you're dealing with certain types of clientele, 60 to 90 days, you are suddenly, and they know this, certain types of clientele are basically using the architecture firm um, as a source of free financing. They are getting all of this work interest-free up front, and the firm, the architecture firm is basically running an interest-free bank loan. And that's mm -hmm. not what architecture practices are set up to do. And yet it happens time and time again. So, yeah, don't do that. Yeah, no, I mean, I've, I've again, this, this kind of frightens me and upsets me when I, when I hear stories, that particularly, they tend to be New York developers, but um, who, are, who are very skilled at, at knowing how to leverage their consultant team with not having, you know, not paying them or getting them, you know, kind of getting them uh, leveraging these sorts of, they're leveraging their risk basically, and the architects mm -hmm. not getting any upside of that risk. Yeah. Developers the as a whole, will. yeah, mm -hmm. they have high risk, high reward. But what it mm -hmm. means as a consultant is we just have high risk. We're not we're not banking on any of the reward. We're just trying. Mm. The reward is you actually get paid for the work that you do. There's no extra but, terms in there that really benefit the risk that's being put forward. So so even even if we're billing say on a monthly cycle, um, and we're billing say for the work that's done on a certain on a certain project. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that as well is also vulnerable. It's vulnerable to the same sorts of things that, you know, that a milestone billing would be because you could be preparing to bill for 
you know, $20,000 worth of work. And then for whatever reason, you only managed to get 5,000 of your work done. So now you're billing for 5,000 and now your cash flow's taken another hit for the same reason. Yeah. And it's better than, it's better than zero. Yeah. But how, how do we, how, how, how have you seen practices kind of start to navigate that? Is there any innovations you've seen in, in, in kind of billing or invoicing at all? Um, I would say when we've had those types of situations, there are projects that we can foresee that there might be a flux in the amount of work each month. And so when we lay out a, um, a contract, we actually have a payment uh, calendar, payment schedule, in which case we're still billing them monthly, but we're p billing them in percentage um, of the project that we assume by like a, with, within three to four months, we would be catching up in total. So we're not doing a full milestone. We're, we're breaking out maybe the, the milestone calendar into like four equal parts. So there might be one month where you're billing a little less. And there might be one month you're billing a little more, but it's, at least it's consistent. And if the client agrees to that, what you're internally doing, um, it's really the responsibility is on you and less at the mercy of when the client's going to pay you for it. Um, we should reiterate too, like knowing one month out, it's better than knowing something that's six months compound, compounded over time. Mm -hmm. But like a difference of 20,000 is way better than a difference of like 60 or 120,000. Mm -hmm. uh, th there's an order of magnitude of why cadence is important. Mm. I also think like during good times, uh, when it, when the phones were ringing, clients were probably knocking on the door for everyone. And I think we've gotten a, a little bit lazy of maintaining client relationships where I think it's much more important now. So you can get ahead of knowing what is the, the financial circumstance of your clients before mm -hmm. the billing cycle even hits. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not very innovative. It's very old school and very traditional, but very important as a service industry, as architects. Mm -hmm that we serve clients and like you, you have to maintain that client relationship. Mm -hmm. And the tighter that relationship is, the more information you're gonna know before it's late. Mm -hmm. um, and you can be very creative if you know information early. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a client hypothetically saying like, we might have a rough month this month making that payment, but it will be okay the following month. But if you know that upfront, you can mm -hmm. design in models and, and be creative in how do you resolve those difficulties. Not having that relationship puts you on a defensive mindset mm -hmm. uh, and makes resolving that problem a little bit more harder. So try mm -hmm. to get ahead. I think that's great. And I, I think as well, you know, if it, the, the more that you understand, say, your client's financial mechanisms, how their financial cycles are working, you can actually, I mean, I've seen practices in the past who have used this to their advantage where they've you know, they've created offers, if you like, with how they get paid. And if their payment structure, if you like, is becoming more risky, then the price goes up, mm -hmm. basically. And you might see this and, you know, uh, kind of most extreme example might be an architect who doesn't uh, receive any pay until after planning approvals, for example, but then they take a much, much bigger chunk of fee than they would have done if they were getting paid. Mm -hmm you know, a monthly invoicing. And I, and I think a lot of developers start to like that because it's deal making. <laughs> and it's kind of, if we're going to take the risk, then we can preempt taking risk and actually structure a deal that's, that's win-win. Interesting. I, I don't usually like those because that means as an architect, you have to figure out how to float. Yeah. Uh, mm. And yeah. architecture firms don't typically have enough cash to float for a very long period of time. Yeah. This, this <laughs> is why like I, Cadence is so important because I can know for this business typology, floating is very, very difficult. And it's very different than like a developer's business where they're, they're, they have it's much larger money. cash reserves yeah. where yeah. they can float for that return to come back. That isn't the case for most architecture firms and yeah. even harder for firms smaller mm -hmm. um, than the one that you're at, Sarah. So like it's, yeah. it's really important that we don't immediately entertain those options mm -hmm. unless we actually have the cash to do so yeah i would agree yes i mean that type of thing certainly needs to be inside of a, a strategy for yeah. cash flowing yeah. the rest of the projects the rest of the office 
And, and maybe I should add some context to what I said earlier. Like, I think it in part has a little bit of empathy. I, I'm here in California, San Francisco. I'm really close to Silicon Valley Bank. If we all recall the news a few while ago, that bank, they, they had a bank run. Um, mm -hmm. And if you were trying to invoice any clients that were banking out of Silicon Valley Bank, well, they didn't have access to cash. Like, regardless if they wanted to pay you or not, they just didn't have access. And I think knowing that and knowing that they, it was all going to be secured and all of it was going to come back, but they're going to be at least two to three weeks late for things to kind of work out. <laughs> It's just important information to know so you don't immediately go into negative judgment that like, oh, it's a bad client, they're not paying me. It's like, well, like, look, they, they have the cash, we have an open relationship, and it's, it's, it's a little bit out of their control. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd say, I would, yeah, I would reiterate, open communication. You don't have to open your books without still being able to have... Um, an open conversation about what your expectations are as a service provider, what you, their expectations are as a service receiver, um, and how you can coordinate together. It doesn't have to be one side's giving into the other. It can be like, this is what can mutually work for the both of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you... Oh, Go sorry. On. I was going to say Sarah continue. said something earlier in the call about like specific to geographies. So if, mm -hmm. if, if you're an architect practicing in the Bay Area, I, like the first thing you do when you hear news like that was to call your client, like how much exposure do you have to this? Mm -hmm. Like, we just want to make sure we, we get ahead of it. Like if you're a VC who has money in Silicon Valley Bank, if you are a tech executive who might have money in Silicon Valley Bank, if you are a tech company and you're doing like TI work, do you have like just understanding your exposure from the mm -hmm. client to and having that conversation can derail any uncomfortable conversations later. Uh, but it's very geographical specific. Mm -hmm. um, that means like architects know your surrounding, know your local news and your local current events, yep. and it's going to help greatly in terms of navigating the next couple weeks, next couple months, if mm -hmm. not years. Oh, that makes me think of something Ryan had mentioned earlier in the conversation about um, how our news cycles are prone to pointing out the constant state of economic uncertainty combined with Robert's note about geography. Um, I just sat in on a, a leadership council and there was a speaker that was speaking on behalf of the Minneapolis Chamber of Commerce. And he said, you know, every time you open up the local business journal, the one that uh, is circuited uh, around the Twin Cities area, he's like, you know, they have great big headlines about how such and such company, such and such law firm is moving out of the downtown area and um, taking less office space. Um, and he said, I hate to tell you this, but that is not a headline. That has been happening for 20 years. And it's because law firms don't need an entire floor because they don't need an entire floor of files. Everything's now in a thumb drive, right? Like <laughs> he said, so you have to understand the context. You have to understand your geography. You have to understand that even if it's in a financial news cycle, compare it to how it has been the last five years, 10 years, 20 years, and you will find that that's just the state of change and technology. And that just means that new businesses can move into that floor. It doesn't mean that people are moving out of the downtown area. They are taking up less space. And I think that's a key point in um, how architecture is working um, with the news cycles and the financial cycles and the local geography is you need to be aware of how space is being used in your local community, how people are financing it, um, how they are developing it, and then how you as a service provider needs to accommodate those changes. Mm -hmm. I, I'm again this this idea of kind of being very aware and attentive of your of your client and your industry and your context really gives you a lot of uh, intel and intelligence in general of what's you know what where the risks might be happening in your business so that you can kind of prepare for them um, what are the sorts of things that a business should be doing internally um, to ensure that cadence of cash is kind of keeping its rhythm what sorts of obstacles do the architecture practices experience with that? Making sure that the work is getting done on time. Um, on my side, building a budget. Right. Building a budget that reflects the, the cadence, the cash flow, the patterns that you've seen. Again, I'm going to go beat the drum. 
architecture firms have this all have all this information and they just love pattern recognition so they combine those two worlds and understand that you can build a reasonable budget and it can get as granular as you want to want it to be um, the, most people that I've worked with um, have their finances in QuickBooks um, or QuickBooks online those a lot of those tools are built in they can just tell you this is what we would predict a budget would be based on past patterns. Mm -hmm. Then you review it and you see if it actually works for you. And you know maybe what, you know you pay your um, professional liability insurance, which is a, usually got a big price tag once a year. So, you know, you got to drop that into the middle of the year and that's, that's a big piece of cash you need to have. Like just be able to plan, not just predict your cash flow in and out, but build a budget as to because building the budget tells you what you want your cash flow to be. It gives you more control. It puts you more on offense, less on defense. Um, so while I've been doing that 18-month cash flow, I have been building out a 12-month budget that's constantly shifting by one month. At the first week of every month, I'm just building it mm -hmm. out um, based on what reality actually hit and then how it's going to implement down the road. I, I think that's so smart. I would, I would add like for the audience out there, budgeting relative to your entire organization and then budgeting again relative to projects yes. are two typologies of planning and you should do both Yes. Um, because like pro some projects might go away um, and the company is still the company and you kind of need to understand both moving pieces. Mm -hmm. um, so budgeting, totally agree, Sarah. Um, what I would add is once you do establish a budget, track against it. Mm -hmm. uh, I know a lot of friends that like work really hard on an amazing plan. They show me the Robert's plan is so incredible, it's so detailed, and then you put it aside. Yep. And you don't actually track against it. I was like, I just want to pull my hair out uh, because like the whole purpose <laughs> of the plan is to measure against that plan. Yep. Uh, you, you lose the complete value of a plan when you don't actually use it mm -hmm. and measure yourself against it. So like actually tracking, uh, it's really, really important. And that's, that could be your timesheet data. That could mm -hmm. be your milestone data. That could be your effort. That could be your deliverables. Um, uh, that could be your money cash in cash out. Mm -hmm. Um, but regardless, the principle is tracking. It's really yeah. important. Cause the tracking also, it's, it's not that it it will hold you accountable, but it also is a reminder of maybe some things that you forgot, maybe some things you didn't predict because mm -hmm. all of these are planning tools. They're not, they're not finite. They're, they're meant to flow back and forth and paying attention to your historical data, even if the data is just 30 days old. Um, I actually think that's the best time to be looking back because it's still fresh of top of mind. Um, mm -hmm. And you can remember why things happened the way they did. But yeah, then you can compare to what your predictions were. Um, and sometimes it's really satisfying to see how close you were or to understand why you were so far off. And that only helps you. I mean, you turn into your own best algorithm. It helps you just work the plan to a more accurate degree down the line. Mm -hmm. It's calibration. You know, all, yeah, calibration. You're just you're only working to your own benefit down the line. There's no mm. downside to it other than firm or firm leaders don't want to take the time, in which case that's great too. You just hire someone who's willing to do it. And mm -hmm. the small, it can be as a small of a financial investment um, as high, having someone, you know, four hours a month, whatever it is. But I, I will also say this on repeat, the degree to which you invest in having someone m maintain your financial data and keep it current will always pay you back at least twofold, if not tenfold. If you're thinking, mm -hmm. I don't have the time um, to do this and or I'm going to do it when it's so far down the line, I don't have top of mind information that's really relevant. There's no way that that effort's paying me back, so I'm not going to bother or they're yeah, showing Robert their super detailed budgets that just kind of gets set aside for a year. That's not doing you any good. And all that time they spent putting that budget together is wasted and lost, right? But you pay someone, if you don't want to do it yourself, um, to really stay on top of it, it, all it's doing is working towards your benefit. Mm -hmm. I, 
I like to compare it to like working out. Not a lot of people like working out, but we all know it will always pay dividends.、Mm-hmm. And you might not see the dividends on day one, and you shouldn't, right? Like it's it's about repeat, like repeating, repeating, calibrating,、mm-hmm. and being aware. And over time,、uh, the benefits are always outweigh the the initial effort that you put in.、Mm-hmm. Um, it's just it's good it's good hygiene. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Um, it's interesting as well. Then you know, kind of developing a budget and having budgets for for projects, and how does this get communicated to the people on you know doing the work, for example?、Mm-hmm. Because this is often where there's a bit of a disconnect, and you know, and we were we were kind of joking earlier, Sarah, about timesheets. Uh, and and this is I've spoken to many、uh, architects, practice offices, where just just trying to get people to do timesheets. When we've got all sorts of innovations, and our monographs got all sorts of wonderful tools on it to make. It, I mean, it's so easy to actually record your timesheets, but yet people have a reluctance to do it. I know there's things like there's bits of spyware now that are available, and there's you know Timebro and all sorts of other bits of apps that kind of you know are logging things. But I, I get the sense sometimes that there's maybe a bit of a disconnect between、um, the business mechanisms, if you like, and this activity of doing a timesheet. Or maybe it's just、mm. timesheets are boring to do. No one wants. No one wants to do it. We haven't. We haven't made it sexy yet.、Um, I've found it's either that it's boring,、um, that there's a, or if some, for some people it's a level of self-consciousness. Uh, worry that they spent too much time on something,、mm-hmm. um, or that they aren't being completely accountable for their time.、Mm-hmm. Um, so those are usually the hang-ups. In which case, those are individual issues, not necessarily the actual、um, need, not the issue of the actual need.、Um, yeah. You know, there's yeah, you're right. There's all these tools. There's all these、um, procedures. I like to overlay. A solid dose of guilt and fear, which you know, still doesn't <laughs> always work to my benefit.、Um, one thing that I know I can speak of for Monograph, just because we are end users of it in terms of budgeting and time allotments, is there is the ability, and we do this every single week as the project managers go through each one of their projects and they allot hours. For each person on the team, against the specific project and specific phase they're working on, so as individuals are entering their time, they can see how it's compared to the budget. My role has been a to have an overarching view of that, make sure it's being done,、um, that it's within reason, that no one's、mm-hmm. frying out, that no one doesn't have enough to do, but also constantly reminding individuals, teams, leaders that this is a tool. It is not Big Brother. It is a way for you to. Not only measure your own effort, but for us to learn from it. So, if we said we need you to be working on this task or this milestone or this phase for 20 hours, and it takes you 40, I need you to honestly put that in your timesheet so we know next time this was a huge overage and we understand why. Because maybe it took different levels of. Um, software impl- implementation. It took a couple more meetings. Whatever it was that we didn't factor for, we need this from you for future planning as much as we need it for you for the sake of like payroll or、um, daily, you know, accountability. That's not what it is. It's it's needing people to understand that we need the information for the future efficiency of the company and which is、mm-hmm. subsequent future profitability for the company. Two way street.、Um... Thank you, Sarah. I think I think we have a really strong approach here at Monograph, where if we work really hard to make it a an area where you want to constantly come back and the experience is great,、uh, that you're going to be more likely to enter time.、Uh, and that's a really different stance than, let's say, like older school legacy software, where like experience was not so great and you wanted to get in and get out as fast as possible. Well, if that's the mindset. You're more likely to have dirty data,、um, mm-hmm. a little bit garbage in, garbage out, which is not、mm-hmm. useful for the organization.、Mm-hmm. Um, when I was an architect, one of the things that it was a tough lesson for me. I worked, I worked really, really hard at a larger, larger organization, a lot of hours, and I didn't always put all those hours in.、Mm-hmm. 
Then what happened was like when I got a new project assignment, they assumed that I can do it on that same timeline. And yeah. I kept working really, really hard. And I kind of shot myself in my own foot because yep. um, I wasn't honest with my team. And it's not the principal or the project manager's fault because they're, they're planning with the data that I put in. <laughs> um, and that, that gave me a lot of awareness when I started Monograph about mm -hmm. three and a half, four years ago. It was like, I don't mm -hmm. want to repeat that mistake. And I really don't want the industry to continue to re repeat mistakes I've made. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to have the integrity of the right amount of time. Mm -hmm. And it's also really important for project managers and principals to own mistakes when like we've miscalculated the scope. Uh, and that's okay. Like we're, we're going to take that as a learning lesson so that we don't repeat it for the next project. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we don't fix the cycle, it repeats. Mm -hmm. yep. I yep. also caught a little bit on this like historical divide in terms of the information, like financial information down to mm -hmm. the designers. I, I think it's really time for that to go away. Yeah. I think it's really important for young designers to understand the implications of their value of their time and the role it plays from a finance and ops perspective. They, they don't need to be the next Sarah. They don't need to be like 100% full-time in finance and ops, but they do need to understand mm -hmm. the, the value of their time and the mm -hmm. implications of their time yeah. and the way yeah. it impacts design decisions. Um, and I think like bridging that gap and removing that divide would be a huge, it's, it's a huge motive of mine. And I hope to accomplish as I continue to build Monograph as one of our, one of our values. I will say when we rolled out within Monograph, um, we got every project loaded in, we got all of the time um, and planning rolled, rolled in, and then we presented it to the company and everyone assumed like, oh, this is just what, what Sarah sees, who's the admin of the account. And it was like, no, this is what everybody can see. Mm -hmm. Everybody can see what this project fee is, how it's broken down by phase. You can see what other people are working on. You can see the time other people um, are dedicated to something because that was a lot of the feedback we would get. Even, I know we are big for a small firm, but we're still relatively a small firm with 40 people. And mm -hmm. we would get feedback saying, well, why are there only three people on my project and that team has six people? And you would have to point out, well, this is the way the fee breaks out and more fee, more scope, more need for more bodies. And when you don't have that understanding of not just what other people are working on, but the, the depth of the project and what it demands, it really can make some challenging work relationships and some hard internal feelings. And it's just like, it's all here. You can just look. Yeah. It's, it was never meant, it was never meant to be opaque on our end. It's mm -hmm. just, we never had the tools to kind of present it universally, like project managers had a planning spreadsheet and it stayed in the project manager's folder. And a lot of times, bless them, it would stay on their desktop and then even I couldn't see it. And then it was like some sort of black ops procedure to try to wrangle it away from them. And by the time I'd get it, it was so out of date and it was the information wasn't live. And, you know, it's being able to have tools available that are, um, live that you can tell people the more information you put into it, meaning the more timely your time is entered, the more it's going to be accurately telling you mm -hmm. how this project is running. Um, and so everyone has a bit of ownership in that. And uh, I, I think it has been, I mean, we're new to it, but I think it's been a game changer in terms of communicating, as Robert was saying, the importance of and the value of the individual's effort on every project in every, in, in every role. I, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of this conversation. I, I, I do like the, you know, I'm, I'm with you both on this of being more transparent mm -hmm. with your team members really establishes a much more healthy working culture and removes some of the mystery and helps team members be able to locate themselves within the business and what their work mm -hmm. is actually contributing to. Yeah. I, I think of it all as literacy. Like mm -hmm. I, I've never met an architect that didn't know what needed to be done. Mm -hmm. Like every architect I've met, I've always known what what drawing they needed to do, what what detail they needed to finish, what email they needed to write. 
Um, what I, it's just what that they I, want to do it all at once. <laughs> it's hyper, it's hyper literacy. Yeah. Uh, where, where I think we're doing a good job is a little bit more on like getting everyone up to speed on financial literacy. Mm -hmm. Right. Where, where I think like, it's really like no one has a problem with what tasks they have to do. Like let's, mm -hmm. let's just bridge that gap and link it back to financial literacy. Mm -hmm. Um, what I'm really excited is like, I think, I think we're, I think we're going to have a really big impact on amazingly well-rounded, stronger architects and stronger architectural leaders in the mm -hmm. years to come, because that, that foundation is starting earlier, mm -hmm. um, which means it's going to be much more well-rounded when young architects and young designers mature into leadership positions, yeah. uh, which I'm really, really excited for. Yeah, that's a good point. I would say, I mean, I never understood firm financials. I was never privy to that because when I was practicing, I never reached that level of project manager or mm -hmm. senior project manager. Um, I never understood the impact. I never even think I even knew what my billing rate was. And like now we're making it clear. I think it's even more important for the people that are just coming out of school um, when they have no experience in firms and they need to be reminded we are actually a commodity. And it's great that you came out of a school and you had projects with no budget, no clients, no schedules, and somehow often like no geography or sometimes gravity that was going to apply to whatever your design is. But we have all those things here. Um, and you need to know how your effort is actually being translated into the means to be able to pay you. And we want to be able to pay you, but you know, there's, there's limits. And so how can we help you learn what those limits mm -hmm. are? I, 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 it's so important. I mean, I'm, I'm often reminded of a, a time a few years back where I had somebody, an employee, a young, a young guy listening to the podcast and was kind of getting frustrated at, uh, at his, at the lack of transparency with his boss. And he found out what his billing rate was and he was shocked and he found my phone number online or something. I don't know how he got my details, but he phoned me up and was in quite an upset state and felt like he was being ripped off because his, he discovered that his boss was billing him out at about three times what he was getting paid. And, and it was very interesting because, it, because clearly there was like, that's, a, that's like a, as a result of a lack of transparency and mm -hmm. culture because mm -hmm. that, that individual felt like they were being shafted basically. Yeah. And, you know, and it's not, you know, well done yeah. to the boss because that that's what he should be doing, building, yeah. building people out at three times this amount. But for the team member, it didn't land like that. And, you know, there was, that's a kind of this old guard of architectural mm -hmm. business, if you like, which has always been to kind of, you know, whether it was intentional or not intentional and, you know, the, the tools haven't been there. There has been this, this wall, if you like, of, <laughs> of um, not disclosing information. I guess my next question would be is how much transparency like is there a limit do we do we start sharing people's what everyone's getting paid or oh i'm in the midwest i don't think that would go over well <laughs> <laughs> our our crew has a hard time making eye contact so i don't know the sharing actual salaries but i will say um in wanting to share information uh we started doing quarterly financial updates. And when I share them, I start, I start the end, it starts at the end of the year. Well, I mean, it's a cycle, but you could say in December, I project with pretty accurate certainty of where we're gonna land at the end of the calendar year. And if that will lead to um, bonuses, profit sharing, things like that. And also how it compared to what we were predicting at the beginning of the year. And then in January, after the year has closed out, show what the actuals were and then actually show mm -hmm. what's projected for that calendar year. And then each quarter, it's a comparison and it's showing, as we were talking about before with budgets, it's this is what we were predicting. Here's where we actually landed. And here's why. Um, we've done things where I think I started every meeting explaining the difference between a cash and accrual basis. So people understood just the basics of 
just because you've worked so, so hard this quarter, it might not actually show up on this quarter's financials. It's going to be offset because mm -hmm. we are only reporting based on the money we took in, not yep. the service fee we generated and then we got paid for it. So if you're feeling that you worked really hard this quarter and you're wondering why there's a deficit, you're going to expect to see it show up down the line. And I've gotten some feedback that that was actually helpful for people to understand because they couldn't get mm -hmm. why what they were physically um, experiencing wasn't showing up economically on a report. Um, we have shared for the first time this year everyone's billing rate. And it was not because we never wanted to share that, but just never, like, we just didn't think to. And then there was no reason not to because mm -hmm. um, obviously there are disparities in billing rates based on levels of experience and responsibility and role. And we thought it was important for people to understand why some people have fewer hours on a project, but they're at a higher rate and people who um, have more hours in a project, they're at a lower rate and why that is. Uh, we've shared what our overhead percentage is because we get audited by um, our local municipality um, for our overhead rate anyways. We have to publicly present it, and that's built into our contract negotiations. Right. So everyone knows what our overhead rate is. And um, so I suppose if someone really wanted to sit down and do the math and work it backwards, like this is what their billing rate is and this is what's built. I mean, they could do it if they wanted to and find out everyone's salary. I don't know that anyone necessarily wants to. Yeah, but um, we share we share what our expenses are for all employee benefits, and that they mm -hmm. are basically eighty percent of our expenses for the year goes to employee wages and benefits. We show how the rest of the expenses break out. Um, so I guess that's a long-winded answer to say we share as much as we can and we share what we feel will be helpful for individuals to understand how the firm is in terms of its financial health and where it could potentially go. Mm -hmm. Sarah, I couldn't have done a better answer. Thanks, Robert. I, I love the fact, and I, I really hope I want to reiterate to, to our listeners how often Sarah used the word why. Because I think that's the most important, like when sharing mm -hmm. information is to disclose the reasons why. Mm -hmm. um, and when I can go back to example, like why is someone's um, cost, someone's billable rate is three times their cost rate. Well, at the end of the day, that only maintains a 20% margin from the business. Mm -hmm. So like another mm -hmm. way to describe it, if it's not three times, then our margins for the business is actually substantially smaller. Mm -hmm. It can get to the point where we don't have a margin for profit, and that's not good for the business. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's there's a cost of doing business, like your benefits, like the rent of the building, like the equipment that you use, and that's baked in. Why there's always a a leap from what it costs to pay you, mm -hmm. um, and what your billable rate is. But like spending a little bit of time on the why helps the entire industry. Another our, way um, I, might... I was going to say our business uh, development director, she is big on the why. So she has taught me like when we are explaining things, we want to explain why. And it works not just for outward business development, but I'm finding it's very helpful for internal development. It's, it's, it's key so factor. key to growth for, mm -hmm. for a young designer to understand why the decisions are being made at the executive level means that they're yeah. better prepared to grow into an executive level later. Mm -hmm. Um, and to like reiterate, let's say my version of like how much detail is too much detail. Just remember the goal of your firm owner. The mm -hmm. goal is like, I, we want to execute on projects at a really high degree. So we want mm -hmm. to share enough information so the team can continue to execute at a very high bar. Mm -hmm. Second, I want to make sure that I continue to invest in all of our talent across seniority. So from the youngest all the way to the most senior, the reasons we expose information is continue to invest in the team so they understand the why and get to the next level. Individual Brilliant. pay stubs, individual salaries, they're not going to further advance the company. And it's a yeah. little bit too personal and too in the weeds detail to share publicly. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that's say, kind of like my framework of thinking in. I'll say on the flip side, um, because I know that some legislation or rules just changed in New York, but as we go through the hiring process and people 
put forward, mm -hmm. uh, candidates put forward what they want to be paid. Yep. And if it's not within a close percentage point of what we would be able to offer, we, I explain the whole math why. Like I work backwards and say, based on our region and our size and the type of work that we do, here's where we fall in this bracket according to all of these different, you know, data demographics and here's our overhead rate and here's the profit. And so this is what it comes down to. It's just, it's just math. It's not, it's not a personal attack on your abilities. It's not us wanting to thwart your um, financial advancement going from one firm to the other. It's just, this is actually what our firm can support. And the more that we can hire for what we can support, the more that we can do long-term investments and keep you for the long run rather than being the kind of firm that hires for a project and then lays off when it's done, which is never yeah. our, it's never part of our plan. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. I mean, that's a perfect place to conclude the conversation there. Um, we've just about hit our, hit our time, but Sarah and Robert, thank you so much. That was very, very insightful. Um, and, and thoroughly enjoyed your sharing your expertise. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.